Let's go. So there's this guy, very mysterious individual. His name was King James. There's a lot surrounding his life that a lot of people don't like. There's a lot about the guy that is absolutely lovable. There are a lot of myths surrounding his life that are being, let's just say it, they're being, oh dang, I can't even think of the word, being exploited to all sorts of political agendas. There's one thing specific that this king did during his lifetime that has me super duper curious. The guy's... The guy had a problem with uh, witchcraft. He had a real problem with witchcraft. He believed that he was the focus of a plot carried out, executed, planned by a, a not just a coven, but an entire network of witches, which stretched across Europe and possibly the world. That's the exact thing we're trying to talk about on this on this YouTube channel. The Bible version conspiracy. Why did that start again? Okay. I'm turning off my keyboard. It was probably my fault. <sighs> this is exactly what we're talking about on this YouTube channel. This behind-the-scenes movement of uh, a conspiracy against the Word of God, against Christianity, and that it's real that's the hardest thing to that it seems to get people to to realize is that this is real there's a lot of different evidences that we've covered on this channel before and a lot of different videos i appreciate you watching these episodes you're probably familiar with them already if you haven't refer back to some of the other videos or if you want to contact me you can contact me at bibleversionconspiracy.com right there under my name. There's links in the there's links in the description. Don't worry, I got you. There's a lot to think about when it comes to King James. There's a lot that I'm going to try to say carefully. Because I haven't put a lot of research into the man's life, his character, his beliefs. I haven't put that much study into him yet. I am just getting introduced to what um, what uh, David Teams calls our James. I am just starting to learn about his character, about the trials that he went through in his life, about the uh, just it, it was an absolute nightmare something that nobody should have to go through and it makes you uh, suspicious as to what might actually be going on behind the scenes i'm gonna try to hit a lot of different things tonight next week is on a completely different topic but i wanted to get this out because I definitely want to record my initial thoughts 
about King James, about the end game of whatever conspiracy he was facing at that point in time. Try to get those in order. And then just see how much of it actually turns out to be legitimate. Because I think that there's going to be a lot more of it that's going to be legitimate than I probably even expect. It's it's going to be a wild ride. So, hate to break it to you. At this time of all times, when you're trying to watch YouTube, trying to enjoy yourself, trying to be entertained, there's a conspiracy behind the Bible version of controversy, which is undermining Christianity and our civilization at this very moment. My name is Joseph Armstrong. Welcome to the Bible version conspiracy. On this channel, we seek to expose not only the conspiracy that we believe is lies behind the modern Bible translation controversy, but also to, t to tackle the difficult questions about history and the King James Bible's accuracy and its supernatural character. If you care to join us on a deeper level, a level that only, only I would say, roughly estimating, only about 0.5% or less, maybe 0.2%, not even 2%, 0.2%. I haven't done the calculations, but it is really small, and that's pretty close. Of the people that watch this channel, of the people that are subscribed to our channel even less, but of the people that watch this channel, there are only a hand, not even a handful, just a few people that join this discussion that have access to documentation to pages that we haven't even published yet. There's a handful of people out there in the world. You might call them one percenters, if it's even that high, that have access to what we're doing, what we're finding out, what we're planning, what we're writing. And have access to it before it ever even becomes public. And it, some of it may not even become public. But they have access to it. And I'm talking to you, co-conspirators. You guys have access to anything that you want. If you don't have it, ask. And I'll help you out. There are books that I have over here. Like one that we're going to be referencing tonight. Like King James unjustly accused. As a co-conspirator, you have a high priority to me, to my ministry, to my family. Because you're helping us do this. You're giving us encouragement. You're giving us the means to make subscription payments. You guys are helping us tremendously in ways you don't even know. If you need something like, hey, Joseph, would you be able to shoot me, you know, you would mention this chapter in this 500 page book, not 500 page book. It might even be 500, 392 page book. It's thinking $500. If you try to order, order it on Amazon, I got it for just like a little bit under $100, like I don't know, 12 years ago, something like that. And uh, Joseph, you mentioned this chapter. Would you be able to shoot me pictures of every page in that chapter so I can look at it myself? Absolutely. If you're not a co-conspirator, I, I, pr I probably can, but I'm not going to be able to guarantee it. If you're a co-conspirator, your wish is my demand, basically. So, if you guys want to join us on that deeper level, on the co-conspirator membership level, head on down to the description. Click that link. $7 a month it helps us do what we do, and we deeply appreciate it. And we deeply appreciate the awesomeness of the people that 
unfortunately aren't able to join us tonight. But there's one person that's kind of cool. If you can leave a YouTube comment, dear one person, that would be amazing. Just so I know who's with me tonight. That'd be sweet. All right. Be sure to join us for the whole stream. I highly recommend that you join us for the whole stream because there's a lot of things that are going to be coming out tonight. I kind of have to build up to it. That's how these episodes go. Just in case you're only joining us for like the first 10 minutes or so and then you kind of drop out. Stay, stick around for the entire episode because usually I have to lay a lot of groundwork. I have to lay a, a lot of framework around different things that I have to bring up once I have built upon the different things. It's Tonight's going to be weird. It's always weird. My mind is weird. This all of this stuff is it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to think about. And I enjoy thinking about the Bible translation controversy. Notice how I say that carefully every time. I don't I I am not here to justify Peter Ruckman. I'm not here to justify Gail Ripplinger. I'm not here to justify Sam Gipp. I'm not here to justify any King James only author and anything that they said. That's not my job. My job is to confirm what they said, obviously, because I wouldn't want to promote something that they say that's not 100% accurate. But what I want to do is I want to help to expose the controversy the good sides, the good parts of both sides, and the parts where both sides are wrong because both sides have problems. Quotations that are out of context, arguments that are defunct, outdated information, all sorts of things like this. And uh, there is all, and, 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 even things where people make even conspiracies sometimes. Once in a while you find somebody and they don't go far enough. Myself included. Sometimes I don't go far enough. Sometimes I don't remember all these different aspects of different things. That's what you guys are here for. This is not just a me effort. This is a group effort. That's why it's on social media. You guys can make comments and help us expand the territory that we can cover with the this expose and i believe this conspiracy is not just behind the modern version users you know oh they're using satan's bible and you don't think that satan concerns himself with the people that believe the real bible we seek to expose the conspiracy on both sides and there's more than enough on both sides to talk about. Hang on a second. It's Daniel Jones, the enigmatic, the mysterious, the eccentric. The amazing. The pithy, the colorful, the illustrious Dr. Jones. Complete with a whip and a fedora at all times. <laughs> and there he is. So that's the enigmatic Dr. Jones. He's uh, he's an enigma. That's for sure. And like I said on another, on another episode, you, you can thank, here he is, you can thank the little, uh, is that a, yes, the little monocle, a little monocle and a clover. That's his, uh, that's his mark. If you see a monocle and a four leaf clover lying around, chances are he's been there looking for some lost artifact. His latest find is a genuine Irish potato that was grown in a bed of gold. You know, in a pot of gold. There we go. By a leprechaun. And he found it. Anyways. 
So, let's start talking about this weird stuff that I mentioned. I'm going to give you guys a little sneak peek at a completely not ready page. How's that sound? It's something that I've been working on just today. It's not finished yet, but it's going to serve to furnish us with some talking points. So let me present, share screen, and we're going to share on our browser. Here we go. So this is our King James page in the working. Let me get rid of that sidebar. This is our King James page in the working. That's King James, the sixth of Scotland, the first of England. And he lived from 1566 to 1625. Click that handy dandy little link right there. Once the page is published, obviously, it'll be, uh, what is it? It hasn't been published yet. It will be I don't want it to be separated by a hyphen. I don't like hyphens. Because when you try to explain a URL to somebody, they're like, you know, you got to explain that there's a hyphen there and everything. So before I forget, I'm going to get rid of that hyphen. Don't like hyphens. I like saying that something is as one word. King James as one word. Not King hyphen James hyphen 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 hyphen. But that's just me. Save that draft. And we're going to get rid of that little sidebar. Okie dokie. So the King, the James, the Bible, because King James did authorize the translation of the King James Bible. He, uh, they, they were like, hey, King, we want a new Bible. And they went to him and they're like, hey, and he said, absolutely. He authorized it to be translated. And I believe in the beginning of the uh, the facsimile, you can see that it was authorized by him as well. King James VI of Scotland, the first of England, authorized the translation of the King James Bible in 1604, soon after he ascended the throne of England after his cousin Queen Elizabeth I's death in 1603. Sentence probably needs a little work. Like I said, not finished. <sighs> to this day, there's no small controversy surrounding this king. It seems to be a priority. Now, this is something this is something that I like. I, I personally like my own channel because of this aspect of our channel. I am not here to um to uh, give to regurgitate Dean Bergen to you. I am not here to go, hey, look, 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 look. Gail Ripplinger said, thus spake Zara Ripplinger. That's not why I'm here. I am here to investigate the claims of King James Bible believers like myself. And yes, there it is. There's the golden potato, just like I said. See, I, I, I never lie to you. <laughs> this image has not been photoshopped. Uh, but anyways, so I'm not here to go, oh, look, on this page. Wow, look at this amazing thing that Gail Replinger has. And she's got some really good stuff. Not all of it's in context, but she's got some really good stuff. There's a lot of things that I'm finding out that are not so great, but that's for another time. We're here to look, to take a critical look 
at both sides. If I see something, and this is where I want to be honest, and this is where I want to hear your input. If you're like Joseph, I appreciate your skepticism, but I think that Gail was 100% on this, and here's why. Or, Joseph, I appreciate what you're saying about this aspect of something, but I disagree. This is for to, this is this channel is for to have a good discussion. And that discussion involves you. Comment on the YouTube videos, send me emails, whatever. If you have an opinion or if you have a thought that's just like, hey, wait a second. This ties into that, or Joseph, that connection doesn't really work because of I want to hear it. I want to hear it so bad. So that's your open invitation. It seems like one of the big pushes, though, in King James onlyism, and it's so weird, but is it weird? It's it's kind of, it's it's expected for King James to be constantly defended. It makes sense. King James was the king that God used to bring the King James Bible into the world. It makes sense for a King James Bible believer to not want a wicked king to be the guy who authorized the translation of the Bible that they're using. It makes sense for a Christian who uses a modern version not to want somebody corrupt to be at the fountainhead of the Bible that they have, even though sometimes that is very much the case other episodes. So, when it comes to let's get this back up to full size. When it comes to King James. And I'm not I'm not disagreeing with the the uh the uh the mission here. It seems to be a priority in many KJV only works to attempt to in I might be spelling this in different uh differently, but anyways, to uh, attempt to endear him to the heart of uh, KJV-only folk as an anti-Catholic evangelical Christian. That's literally what Gail calls him in, in, uh, in awe of thy word, an evangelical Christian. And he was, in a certain sense. He was not an evangelical Christian like we would think of, like an evangelical Baptist or Lutheran or what have you. He was still obviously Anglican. He saw himself as the defender of the Church of England, and he he literally was because it was a uh, you know state church. So, but he wasn't you know your typical evangelical Christian. He did witness a lot, led a lot of people to Christ. Uh, to my understanding, he was extremely anti-Catholic, like extremely. He has some men, he has many choice things to say about them in his works. There, but of course, there is no time wasted in polishing his reputation. And he emerges the greatest, most godly monarch Britain ever had. And I must say, he probably was. He probably was, at least for that period, probably the most godly monarch that the British Isles had. He was in between several different rulers that were either very strongly Catholic or just downright awful. So he kind of served as a as a safe space in that in that time. From what I've seen, he was an exceptionally godly man in a long line of monarchs who can only be described as not, especially by their contemporaries. There were a lot of choice things that a lot of different people said, especially John Knox about Mary, Queen of Scots. They, that they just, you know, their contemporaries lambasted them on at every opportunity. No mercy. But when it came to King James, they were just like, wow, this guy's actually 
we actually like this guy. His 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 morality and his love for the word of God. All sorts of things. Just people liked it a lot. Not saying that he didn't have any, you know, anti fans, you know. He had his fair share of enemies. Obviously, he was king. But got to give him credit where credit's due. This is where this comes up, because that book that I showed you a second ago, King James Unjustly Accused, if you pick up, oh boy, if you pick up the copy that's available on Amazon today, it's like 500 bucks, more power to you. More power to you. Uh, if you want me, like I mentioned later on on this page, if you want me to, Eh, I can't get rid of that white bar, can I? Eh, whatever. If you'd like me to, let me know. Would you like me to go and read King James Unjustly Accused? Give you my thoughts on the key points or what have you. What have you. And uh, basically expose the book to uh, public scrutiny and uh, public digestion. You know, let me know what you think. Is that something that you think that we should spend a lot of time on? Maybe I could do a public one that has a lot. And then I could do a private one that has even more. Let's see what we can do. Let me know what you think. If that's something you're interested in, yeah, hit me up. Let's go. All right. So King James is a famous homosexual monarch. Isn't that great? We've heard that a bazillion times. Now, listening to the autobiographical, not autobiographical, the uh, biographical information about King James in uh, David Team's book. I have not finished it yet. I love audiobooks because I can actually get through a book that way. According to David Teams, the author of Majesty, that's... This book right here, I'll try to get a link for that in the description to you. The King Behind the King James Bible by David Teams. So, he says that James did, in fact, possess some homosexual tendencies in his youth. At least. I don't I haven't noticed anything now that he's grown up. Not you. Not a lot of discussion about it, really. There are parts that uh, uh, Stephen A. Coston Sr. in uh, King James Unjustly Accused that he talks about where James was um, accused of different things. I think more so after he died and by people that didn't actually know him. It depends. There's a there's a chapter that I'm looking forward to getting into called "He Says She Says." So that should uh, that should furnish a lot of uh, fodder. So according to Teams, James did possess some homosexual tendencies, which were awakened up by the mere presence. Just not not like <gasps> you know, like the guy shows up and he's just like, "Oh my goodness!" No, it's not. That's not what I mean. I mean like. His cousin, as far as I'm aware, did nothing to James. But he, had, James admired him greatly. And he had an awful childhood. Never knew his parents. Was told his wife was a wit, and not his wife. Was told his mother was a witch by John Knox. And, and so many other things. He loved calling her Jezebel. The educators that he had... Uh, were very, very strict, and also hated his mother. His father, I believe, was dead. If I'm not mistaken, his mom actually blew his father to kingdom come somehow. I, If, if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong on that one. I'd have to double-check the book, the book about that. So, anyhow. The awakening of these tendencies in the young James, he was completely love-starved. Completely. And the first person of any of anything that he really 
the, any color in his life was when his French Catholic cousin showed up. These tendencies are not unusual in a child that was neglected like James was. I don't know if he was abused either as a child in those kinds of ways. I don't know. He was by himself. Being raised by full-grown men. I don't know what may have happened to him. I don't. I'm not saying I'm strongly suspicious. I just don't know. He neither knew his parents. He, he knew neither of his parents and was literally starved for affection. As Teams observes, had a young lady relative, such as a girl cousin, showed up to visit young James. These feelings that were stirred in him of love for his cousin, not necessarily like absolutely perverted, but you know, just like a young affection that was just like, you know, not exactly appropriate. As teams observed, observed had a young lady relative visited the young James, these feelings may never have been aroused. Interestingly enough, to the shame of every homosexual in the business, FYI, James went on to shame every homosexual of our day in his skillful converting and skillfully converting this same French Catholic cousin of his to Protestantism. He witnessed to him very intelligently, and his cousin had a lot of questions for him. And King James, to the, su to the surprise of his teachers and his keepers, actually won his Catholic cousin to Protestantism. Teams documents that in his book. Teams does not provide details about these tendencies after his youth, especially after his marriage to Anne of Denmark. The link there takes you to the Wikipedia page. You're welcome. Of course, any KJV-only Baptist like moi does not like the idea of our Bible. I probably I put my, I should put, probably put uh, our Bible being spearheaded by a flaming gay monarch. Probably not going to like that. You know, most Bible-believing Christians are pretty... Uh, now, sorry, we've read the Bible before, and that's not a good thing. So, that's that. A book by Stephen Coston Sr. entitled King James and Justly Accused, first recommended to me by Gail Ripplinger during one of our long telephone conversations, goes into great depth explaining how James could not have been a homosexual due to several di different things. He was in a loving relationship with his wife, Anne. His many children, not indicative of uh, having a homosexual preference. And the fact that he wrote vehemently, actually, against homosexuality and effeminacy to his son Henry in the Basilican Doron. That is the book. Uh, uh, I believe that's Latin for a kingly gift. Like a, um, uh, a basilisk is uh, a little king, I believe is the, the name of it. Uh, like a basilisk is like a cockatrice. It's like the uh, basically the the dragon looking thing that is on the uh the seal of wales or it's um it's um heraldry what's the word i'm looking for coat of arms the uh the two legs the two wings the uh rooster like appearance the uh serpentine tail possibly barbed on the end that's a basilisk or a cockatrice so basilicon doron doron must mean gift. I'm not exactly relating it to anything that I can think of in English right now as a as a being sourced from that. But basically, the name translates as the kingly gift. It was written to his son Henry, and he wrote it 
vehemently against things like homosexuality, against keeping a company with effeminate friends, and witchcraft. Hmm. All right, let me make sure that... Oh, Messenger hates me. Oh, but what part of my software or my, or my uh, setup doesn't hate me at this point? Let's see. Did you get the links? We'll see how that goes. All righty then. So... <clears throat> Often there are those who wish to sling an inverted rainbow over the king's name. I need to work on that imagery. And they say that he leaned heavily on his favorites. Uh, the thing is that they fail to recognize, like team does, teams does, that Doe, I need to work on this. Like I said, it's a rough draft. Due to uh, his foot and leg deformities, Possibly due to an early case of childhood rickets, James often needed to lean heavily on anybody nearby. There are many other cases in the He Said, She Said stories. Um, in Costin's book, I believe it's chapter number 8 from page 217 to 242. And that discusses those different items. In this... Uh, it, it is unfortunate that the book is so expensive. It's going for over $500 now. And I'm fortunate for to have gotten it under 100 But like I said, we can do a video series on it and uh, and get it out there. It, it depends on what you guys want. That's, that's, what, that's what having a YouTube channel is about. It's about you guys. By the way, if you guys like another YouTuber... If you guys appreciate their work, if you're following them closely, you might even be part of their membership program. They are there for you. YouTube content creators are public servants. We are here not to just inspire and provoke your thoughts. We are here to look into things, to explore ideas based on feedback that we receive from you. So the more feedback that you can give the people that do uh, that make content that you care about, the more feedback that you can give us, the better. Just so you know. Now, I want to maintain a, he a healthy distance from uh, the extreme of assuming that there was not a sliver of homosexuality in uh, James's entire frame. And also, I want to avoid the extreme, I need to add. I want to avoid the extreme that assumes that he was just like an open, uh, completely ho open homosexual, and he would have been out there, you know, on the street corners with all of the other oppressed people today in every city across America, basically. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Not based on what we can read of his writings, not based on his character of the people that knew him. It just doesn't make any sense. Unfortunately, neither you nor I ever talked to James to find out. The truth is, is that he may have had some slivers, especially in his youth. He he may have also have repented them and grown up to be a godly Christian monarch. Well, that would be a shock, wouldn't it? It's not impossible to repent of those kind of things. Less than godly feelings and then turn to Christ. Unless, of course, you're Stephen Anderson and you hold to what I feel is an unbiblical reprobate, reprobate doctrine, like he promotes. I look forward, I look greatly forward to peering into, uh, peering more intensely into the life of everyone's favorite king in the future. All that being said, it is strange that the modern LG, 
B T Q X Y Z plus minus at symbol dollar sign hashtag exclamation mark community would even want to grace their hall of pride with James's face. Considering the morbidly dark history that most Harry Potter fans absolutely hate him for. Let's get let's get the picture here. Okay, so apparently uh, the idea is that everybody wants King James to be a big part of pride history. Okay. What about the part What about the witch trial murders? Let's make the guy responsible for the uh, British witch trial murders. Let's make him king of pride. He is a king over all the children of pride, Leviathan. Job 41. Interesting. <sighs> Crazy, isn't it? Now, oddly enough, oddly enough, there's the guy that wrote the pink swastika. Oh, over here. Scott Lively. He wrote that a lot of the Nazis were as well. So... Read his book, The Pink Swastika, the big version if you want the whole thing, the, sh the small version if you want to get the gist. So, Kent Hoven, way, way back when I was in college, I watched the Kent Hoven classes, uh, CSE 101, CSE 102, CSE 103, and CSE 201, I believe is what they were. And I enjoyed them. But the thing is, is that in those classes, he mentioned Pink Swastika by Scott Lively. And Abrams, I believe, was a co-author. Um, and he said, it always amazed me how the Nazis could have been so cruel. And then he read that book and he's like, oh, wow. Now I can see why. But the thing is, is that's pretty much all I remember from that whole statement. The thing is there is that a lot of people in that movement are really just after children. Oh, big surprise, right? It's cruel. It's self-serving. It's malicious. It's malignant. So when you have that kind of thing, That's how it turns out. So if you had uh, King James having those homosexual tendencies, I don't know how strong or weak they really were throughout his entire life. He seemed to enjoy Anne enough. What did they have, like nine kids or something? I can't even remember. The... Um, having a him to blame for the uh, witch trials the what some have re referred to as a persecution of them that would add up some claim that he also got some sadistic pleasure out of the inquisition of these witches we'll get into some of the bizarre treatments of that in a little bit so for the people that are watching this video, or... Oh, Jin Jin. Alright, time for me to turn off the keyboard now that you're here and get my drink out of the way. And could you not knock over the light? Could you behave yourself just a tiny, tiny bit? Hey, I think that, um... I think Grandma Harrison might be watching tonight. Maybe... No, that's not a tick. Maybe... You would want to sit on her lap if she was here, huh? Will she be here soon for you so you can sit on her lap? Oh, that would be so nice, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. 
You guys can't see the cat hardly. Let's change that. Jin Jin. Oh, hi, buddy. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You're just happy to get attention because when you know when I'm live, I'll give you attention because people like seeing the kitty. Oh, you're crazy, aren't you? Hey, would you be able to go lay down in that spot where Carl likes to sleep during live streams? You haven't been around for a few days, have you, bud? You still can't get hair all over me. Though. I'll start sneezing and itching. And you can't live on my lap. That looks comfy, cozy, right? Come on. I know. What a poor boy. What a poor, 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 poor boy. You gotta stay there, though, okay? You gotta stay there. I'll try to pay attention to you with my, with my one hand, but I can't do it very long. All right. Enough playing with the cat. Oh, do, 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 do. Okay. You've no doubt read these verses before. I did not include the King James Bible's quotation of Exodus 22, 18, because you've all heard it. Thou shalt not suffer a wish to live. I gave you the Wycliffe Bible, which came well before that. It says, thou shalt not suffer witches to live. And the Legacy Standard Bible, which is supposed to be the most accurate translation today, Ken Ham, it says, you shall not allow a sorceress to live. I don't know why the difference. Sorceress, witches, what have you. I think that it's interesting to note that if you look in the Wycliffe Bible, if you look at the... Um, the uh, Oh, the sorcerers in the uh, the Exodus story that you know are are like um, uh, turning the water into blood, and uh, you know the the different things that they do uh, to to show that they're just as powerful as Moses. Ha ha ha! When they do that, these individuals are referred to as witches they're not referred to as sorcerers i believe that's how the king james bible refers to them or talks about um the magicians possibly it's interesting to note i think that the wycliffe bible uses witches for all those different terms so we just kind of assume that the king james bible has it just the way that it should be on every single point but it might just be that they're all synonymous and they had a different reason for choosing those words other than just complete accuracy of translation I don't know. I've not di I've not dived into it. I hope to at some point. Just saying. All right. So, no doubt you've read those verses or that verse above Exodus 22:18. And you probably fall into one of three categories. First, you don't even think that witchcraft even exists. That's probably the most common one. You think everything's supernatural. Number two, you think this, anything supernatural is of Satan. That's pretty typical of Christians. And three, you actually are a witch. That would be a, probably the minority of the people watching this. And either of those three people, welcome. Innocence under fire. Let's bring this back up. All right, Daniel Jones says, I have the book Majesty, but haven't had a chance to read it yet. I would highly recommend the audiobook. The reader does a very good job. Let's see now. I'm still I'm still trying to placate the cat over here. It's just not gonna leave me alone. On the squibble, the squibble cat. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Crazy cat. All right. Oh, uh, where was I? Right. Okay. I hope I'm doing better on my vocal fry these days. Like not talking like this, you know. Nope. You gotta stay over there, buddy. Sorry.
play with the left hand pal. I can't do it with the right right now. Oh, Kidoke. So, the innocence under fire. The young James had many attempts on his life, as well as many kidnapping attempts. A little king makes an excellent hostage and an even better political bargaining chip or political prisoner. Thank God they were all failed attempts. I mean, not just because he was part of the King James Bible thing. My goodness, he was a child. Thank goodness he wasn't, you know, abducted. He, I'm pretty sure that some people might have even gotten a little ways with him, but he was gotten back. I've, I've got to read the details on all of those, all of those things. I've often wondered how many of these kidnappings, what have you, were Jesuitical campaigns. If memory serves me, James did claim that these attempts on him were instigated by witches. And, of course, he was in a very anti-Catholic country. Great. Hair. Cats, cats, cats. I should just throw them all out before I start. Ah. All right. So, if memory serves, James did attempt, you know, he did say these attempts were instigated by witches, these attempts on his life. Now, that's one thing that I think is overlooked by people that actually talk about James and the uh, the attempts on his life. They they seem to just kind of say, oh, he thinks that the witches were after him all the time. Well, he he blamed his 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 actual legitimate attempts on his life to these witches as well. I'll I'll have to study the nuance on that. I'm just wanting to get out these initial thoughts. And if you guys have any uh, anything to add that you probably know more about this than I, than I do. I'm just getting started. If memory serves, James did claim that these attempts on his life were instigated by witches. And, interesting to note, Helena Petrovich, I believe, Blavatsky. That little link will take you right to her uh, her um, her Wikipedia page. You're welcome. And we have now bright yellow links. Oh my goodness, it's so nice. Not No more orange links. We're in our brand now. It is the specific yellow that we use. Notes. Helena Blavatsky notes that the Society of Jesus is the most, is, is you know, basically consists of the most powerful sorcerers often called witches in the Wycliffe Bible, on the entire planet. So, uh, when you're messing with Jesuits, you're not messing with kittens, okay? Now, that's the thing. Because there was a Jesuit plot later on, the gunpowder plot, to blow uh, King James back to Scotland, basically. Now, the assumption is by a lot of people, oh, witchcraft ceased many full moons ago, right? From what I've learned from former witch former witches and Satanists, that witchcraft and all that jazz is alive and well and more widespread than is comfortable to think about. You hear like on 60 Minutes or what have you, this girl survived like just this this brutal time with her family. She's like, by day, we were regular, ordinary, good old Jewish family. And at night, things got terrifying and disgusting. There was a young girl also that I remember whose mother was involved in some kind of uh, uh, blood ritual because she was either a witch or a Satanist or what have you. And uh, all of the other ladies in this 
person's group came over and they all, you know, got in their birthday suits and had like orgies and whatever. And there was a lot of blood involved. There was tarps all over the place. So it was easy for this lady's daughter to clean it all up. The stuff seems pretty widespread. I mean, I listened to a lot of the confessionals by Tony Merkel. So it may be more widespread in my own mind than it really is. But the amount to which it is spread is very, 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 very concerning. <sighs> my recommendation, if you're all skeptical about it. I would recommend checking out our page on the X vampire that's card carrying christians.com slash X vampire. And that little link right there will take you to it. If you're having a hard time finding it, just go to card carrying Christians, go down to the fear and uh, cults section, and you can go right to the X vampire page. And I would also go to the confessionals the confessionalspodcast.com go to the episodes and search for the word witch and just see what comes up something strike your fancy take a listen it's a real person on there that tony's talking to that they're sharing their story and uh, they're just telling you what happened to them that one night what is happening to them throughout their life what happened with their mother-in-law, what happened with their grandmother, all these different things. An episode for each person. And they give a lot of information that I feel is important. So you can check out, and you can just hit that link at some point when this goes live, and it'll take you right to that search. And there's a whole bunch of episodes for you guys to listen to. Or share with your skeptic friends. The gale. Just in case you didn't know, witches can control the weather. I've heard a lot of stories about this kind of thing happening. I mean, even uh, even uh, Indian rain dancers, they can actually uh, drum up a storm, pun intended. However... They can't obviously do it all the time, or it would never rain on Halloween. Sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't, and other times it's just not worth it. Also, the servants of Satan don't seem to be... Um, also, servants of Satan do not seem to be the only ones capable of such feats. Unless you count the shadow government as certain servants of Satan, which... You really could. Oh, I want to get into something right here. I want to get into it. We might. Also, servants of Satan do not seem to be the only ones capable of such feats unless you count the shadow government and the people who seem to for have, for lack of better terms, powers. Yes, powers, just like the X-Men and the Avengers. But this time, when a storm exclusively pestered James and his queen, something diabol diabolical could have been afoot. And I need to still find what he said. So I'm going to put a little, uh, oh, excuse me, a little spot in there. We're going to add a quote. And I'll add that at some point. So for a little bit more about the weather aspect of things, like I mentioned, I've also heard of uh, young girls being able to control the weather to some capacity. No evidence of witchcraft in their lives. They just seem to be able to do it. <clears throat> and maybe only once or twice in their lifetimes. But it seems to actually be a thing. For more on weather manipulation, see the Confessionals episode 60, A Real Life X-Man. The Confessionals has several other episodes that discover similar powers, but I do not remember which ones they are. Okay.
Sorry. So, the thing here that I want to bring up about the Gale. <sighs> the conspiracy theories are just ah oh, in my mind. Oh my goodness. Okay. Those ones aside, we'll save those ones for another time. Daniel Jones may be thinking along the same lines. But anyhow. <sighs> and just, just so you guys are aware, there are no other YouTube channels talking about what we're talking about tonight. Nobody else is talking about this. Nobody's talking about King James and the witchcraft trials from a conspiratorial King James only perspective. If there is, please tell me. I want to listen to their channel too. This is one of the things about our channel that I like. We get to be creative. We get to, at the end of the day, we get to just say, relax. It's just a conspiracy theory. And other times we just have to be like, wow. What if? And this is one of the things, like, you know, I, like I said, I can't say it enough. I appreciate the creativity that we're able to take with this channel. We're able to contribute something to this discussion that is original. And that is valuable. In, in a, I tell you what, let me, let me get myself a little bit bigger for this rant here I'm about to have. In an absolute, I'm telling you, an absolute ocean of people writing little books and making little YouTube videos and making little things all over the place, all over the internet, all over social media, aping authors who put in a lot of work, like Grady, Gip, Ripplinger, Ruckman. They're aping these people. And there is an absolute sea of them. And none of them are ready to listen to anything but the opinion that they already have about every little thing. Super passionate. But limited. Oh, that's sad. So maybe, hang on, maybe there's somebody else then watching. That'd be really cool. That all right, I'm letting him know that that's okay because he had to go take a phone call. So that's all right. All righty. So. I, I, I like being a, an independent voice in this discussion. I don't, I, I, with this channel, I never, as far as I'm aware, maybe at one point I did, foolishly, I was so young and foolish if I did this. If I wanted to fall in with somebody's agenda behind their book and promote just what they did and not explore options, not give my opinion, not give conspiracy theories, not be not be willing to call out the errors of somebody that everybody respects or get behind somebody that nobody respects. If I feel that they're right on something and then explain why I feel they're right on something and then get criticisms from people, constructive or otherwise, that may prove me wrong. I could be, I could be watching, shameless plug for the guy, he's probably my favorite comedian, Ryan George on YouTube. Look him up if you want to have, if you want to have both sides completely split laughing, look up Ryan George. He is incredible. I could be watching Ryan George right now. I could be making a couch potato out of myself. I could be doing any number of things. But this is fun. I like doing it. And I like 
that you like it. Why else would you be watching it? It's it's an amazing time we're in right now. It's an amazing time. Let's get back into here. Alrighty. Okay. The Demonology. Now, it's a very, very interesting book by King James. I've got a little link to the Wikipedia article right there. I'll try to add a link to the audiobook and the book as well, as well as a um a couple of books of scholarly um acclaim that have kind of worked alongside of it and such. And probably a link where you can get a free PDF copy of one of them. King James wrote his demonology as a dialogue between a fictional someone who seems to have done altogether too much study on witchcraft and an individual who is altogether too curious. Their names are Epistemon and, and oh, what's the guy's name? Epistemon and Philomathes. So the, phyl the Philomath and the Epistemic. So it's a dialogue between these two characters that he made up. Their interactions are designed to keep a very heavy sub subject a little more interesting. And it's not a very big work, the, uh, the demonology, but it is fascinating for a lot of different reasons. Now, I listened, and we'll get into that stuff more when we expand this page. So... I watched this documentary earlier or listened to it on the way home. I wasn't impressed, though. It's by Timeline. It's on YouTube. It's called The Witch Hunter King, King James I's Crusade on Witchcraft. Most of the way through, I got home, and I was pretty unimpressed. Got tired of the hype and the sensationalism pretty quickly. It's one of those documentaries, history channel quality, and with all of the hype and sensationalism that comes with the their nonsense. And then by the time they get to the end of the thing, they just kind of backpedal and say we don't know on the, about the whole thing. So they can just say whatever they want to during the whole video, and they can just end it with, oh, we don't at the end. It's pathetic. It's a pathetic tactic. Get out of here, you loose hair leaving furball leave me alone no 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 i'm gonna throw you outside that's what i'm gonna do you hit my, my toggle keys okay um let me get to my banners real quick i appreciate your patience give me one moment okay nope 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 i'm sorry you're not doing this to me He tells me he'll be a good boy and that he'll just lay on the ground over here, so he he'd better. <sighs> Dandruff and hair floating everywhere. One move and you're going out the door. All right, I think I turned my I think I turned my mic back on. Yep, looketh good. All right. Um. Oh, by the way, what does one of your King James only homies tell you when he sees you? What What is it? What's the question he asks? He goes, "Suppeth," right? <laughs> Of course, that's more, I think, leaving. But. I don't know. Suppeth. Oh, I love that. It's hilarious. All right. 
the demonology. King James wrote his demonology as a dialogue, blah, 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 blah. In this documentary, I had so many issues with it when I was listening to it. The way that they worded things and 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 it's being written sensationally to appeal to appeal to a large audience and keep people hooked to their screens so they'll see ads and they can make money. That's how it is. I got tired of the hype and the sensationalism pretty quickly. Not only that, but I noticed at some points, I noticed some points where the authors are very highly likely. I'm very suspicious. Where they made their wording just a little bit vague on just a couple little spots so they could keep the sensationalism and not have to suffer for it. You know, like so they'll just they'll just say something and just kind of it's a little bit vague here. You don't exactly know if this happened before this or after that. They kind of they kind of creatively make their own story to weave their little web but then they leave a couple of spots just like we're gonna say it this way and not really commit so then it's just like you can't hang them for what they're doing and it can withstand a little bit more academic scrutiny you know and it can serve as an agenda if you watch it carefully, now that's an active link right there. So you can click that. You can go watch the full documentary for yourself. Like I said, they were probably pretty accurate on some of their stuff, but I didn't like it very much. Especially how they uh, how they uh, uh, portrayed the uh, the interrogation of um, what's that lady's name? Agatha Sampson. I forget her first name, but her last name was Sampson. The way they portrayed that made absolutely no sense. It was like she was trying to get herself convicted. It's like it, it was it was it was a uh, it was a sad arrangement. And when you're just when you're reading this, it's like, okay, are, is he trying to fake this testimony? Is this lady completely innocent? Like she's saying, it was it was it was awful, in my opinion. If you watch it carefully. And I would actually recommend listening to it. Not being distracted by all the pretty images and everything else that they give you. And letting that tell a story that goes over the actual words that they're actually putting into this. I would just listen to uh, the audio of it to try to break down the actual information first. In this documentary, there's a lady, I don't know what her name was. Who says that the women accused of witchcraft couldn't be guilty of the things they were accused of? I don't know what context that was. There wasn't a lot of information given around that. I'll have to listen to it again. It's unclear if she meant that Satan doesn't... Now, now this is one of the things. When a, a witch supposedly uh, commits herself to the devil, she's supposed to kiss the devil's cheeks. And I mean uh, the southern cheeks, okay? So uh, either she's saying, uh, it's unclear what she meant, either she's saying that Satan does not possess a physical butt that one can kiss, that witchcraft does not have the power ascribed to it, like changing the weather, or simply that the practice of witchcraft does not exist in her opinion. Get rid of that word, simply. Come on. Work with me, keyboard. That's one thing about having everything wireless. I should invest in ones that I can plug in, too. Either way, they could, in my opinion, have actually done what they are accused of, in my humble opinion. The problem is, even if these things did happen, like the whole thing with kissing the devil's butt, like literally, okay? Don't laugh. It's weird. Okay? It's weird. Don't laugh. So, somebody can portray themselves as, themselves as Satan. I think that that happened a lot. Um, like in um, the, uh, the, the one book that sparked a lot of the satanic panic. Oh, uh, I'm just going to call herself her Julia Remembers. I don't remember what the name of the book was. So-and-so Remembers. 
in that it's pretty obvious that there are people who are playing the, the parts in her memories of Jesus and of angels and of Mary and of Satan, all these different characters that they they they're, they seem like they are literally people that are dressed up that are breaking quote unquote breaking in on these ceremonies and are there to actually brainwash her. So it's pretty it's it's a pretty interesting thing. But anyways, that happens where the guy will just kind of take on the position of Satan, even if in their in the cult's mind, uh, Satan doesn't even exist. That can happen. The uh, the ceremonies performing powerful things and sometimes not. That can happen. Witchcraft actually does exist. It's not because it doesn't exist that the Bible told you not to suffer a witch to live. It's because it does exist. Problem is, however, even if these things did happen, even if there were people that were performing these acts, were the were the women especially the women who suffered for these things were they actually the ones who did it i don't remember her name she's mentioned in the documentary but there was one witch that claimed that she could discern who was a witch and who wasn't Ex basically expose other witches to the authorities by a specific mark in the eyes of these suspects. She accused a lot of people, and I am not 100% sure on how many of them actually suffered due to her accusations, but it was later found out that she was a scammer. Probably. Yeah, this is why I don't like keyboards. Bluetooth keyboards. They're kind of laggy. I've got to invest in getting these things wired. The Bluetooth has been nice for now, but I think I need to get wired soon. So I have my suspicions. I think that she could have been framed. I think that... Because uh, the thing that exposed her was where she identified somebody as not being a witch, and then later on she came back to that same person at some other day, and they were wearing different clothes or what have you. Uh, it might have been part of a test, possibly, and she identified them as a witch. So it's like, did they just become a witch or something, or did you not notice before, or are you a fraud? I have my suspicions, okay? I always do. If I didn't always have my suspicions, we wouldn't have a channel. So I, uh, I always have my suspicions. Where I disagree with the demonology. There's a couple of different things. I'm just going to touch on those quickly. The first one is basically that all angelic appearances are demonic because, you know, Satan just, just disguises himself as an angel of light. And the basic idea that King James had is that all signs, uh, miracles, wonders, an an angelic appearances, and what have you ceased since the time of the apostles. This is the quotation. You can slow it down and read it. It's from the Demonology uh, uh, by Donald, Donald Tyson, page 160. And I don't want to be quick to agree with James. Let me add this, though. I will say that there have been several stories that I've heard where an angel or a dead grandpa who appears magically in a dream or sitting across the living from you in an armchair or whatever, it is pretty, it's been pretty obvious that it was actually something pretty dark in disguise. Um, I've told the story before where a young girl, there's an angel that comes into her bedroom and is like, oh, you're going to be a great prophetess and you're going to restore Christianity to its original purity. Does that sound familiar, Phil Stringer? Does that sound familiar? And uh, she's like, get out of here in the name of Jesus. You're not a real angel. And, pff, and he disappears. And she goes, mommy, mommy. And her mom comes running into the room and she's like, oh, what happened? And she's like, oh, there's this angel. And she said this and this and that. And she's like, well, well really? And she's like, okay, well, um, how did you know it wasn't a real angel? And the little girl says, well, he said he didn't say fear not. And in the Bible, real angels always say fear not. So I knew he wasn't a real angel. And then there's the, 
the guy whose dead grandfather shows up to him in a dream and they have a nice little conversation. And then he's like, hang on a second. Pops, hang on. What is it, son? And he says, okay. So Bible says that, you know, it's pointed out to men once to die and after this to judgment. Why are you here in my dream? What's going on? Grandpa's eyes turn black. Black and cold as lumps of coal. And in a demonic, guttural voice, he says, you're not supposed to ask those questions. And uh, his grandfather leaps on him viciously. Basically attacks him in this dream, and he wakes up. And this is a reoccurring dream for weeks. That regular conversation, he's like, whoa, hang on a second. Asks him, and the same thing happens over and over and over and over again, night after night after night. So, just saying. Folks who deal with seeing the unseen all of the time, this is a different, a different type of situation. There are people who literally walk around all day long and they can see the unseen realm. Some of them have asked for it. Some of them have prayed for it. Some people have gotten more than what they bargained for, I'm sure. There are other people that have other types of issues. Um, I will say that the cruelty that we talked about earlier in the above section, Satanists are apparently very often commissioned by different officials, religious or governmental, in different organizations, to perform the uh, ritualistic abuse mind control that they have been doing for eons. Uh, just they're doing it for pay. Or a trade-off, or something. So... When you have uh, these kind of traumatic experiences, maybe like something that may have happened to King James himself, I don't know. When you have uh, these awful things happen to you, very oftentimes it can trigger something deep inside you. Uh, like, I don't know if it's some kind of defense mechanism that God has put in us, or I, I, I don't know how it works, but a lot of kids that have had uh, experiences that have been uh, just beyond what any child should ever have to suffer in their lives, many times there's some sort of sort uh, some sort of special ability that awakens in them. And uh, that's fascinating to think about because that gives you the idea that people in different organizations are literally creating these these children or adults even later on with special abilities through trauma on purpose for an end. And is it that that's being covered up with the satanic panic? I don't know. King James goes on to talk about how uh, uh, angels and human women could not create monsters like Philomathes is worried about. And here's his discussion of that. And basically the idea is that a devil does not have you know, the seed of a man, let's say. And so they can't produce a child unless they use, like, the body of a dead man or something like this, in which case the stuff is cold or whatever, and if it yields a child, it's not going to be any different than if the living man and the woman had gotten hooked up. So, that's about that. But I would say that one of the best evidences that Philomathes is actually correct and that monsters are produced by the union of the angelic and the uh, natural human 
uh, one of the good evidences of that is uh, Bigfoot. And there's a lot of other kinds of monsters, too. Uh, um, Steve Quayle talks about in his book, uh, Little Creatures, and um, his ones on giants. And how many of our modern sensibilities, our modern Christian sensibilities about the supernatural actually come from the influence of King James's book? It's a good question. Now, I used a graphic. Let me show you. Unless I change the thumbnail at some point, we shall have to see. This is the thumbnail for tonight. He never saw it coming. Now, King James had... Now this is where I like it, because we can get creative with this. And you can give me your opinion as to what you think is going on. I have no doubt that King James probably ended up ridding England of some legitimate witches. Some legitimate witches, I'm sure, were actually burned. If you listen to the confessionals, you will find out that the stereotypical witch that you know you think about and is just malignant and vicious and hurts people and stuff like this, they actually exist. I don't know how many of them were actually taken care of in the witchcraft trials and everything else like this, but I think a lot of innocent people also suffered just like they did in the Middle Ages with the Catholic Church and the Christians that they killed. John Huss was burned as a witch just because they didn't like him, apparently. Was he completely falsely accused? Was he a clairvoyant? Who knows? I, d I don't know. I don't know. I was not there to ask John Huss what was going on. Or even in the colonies, when um, um, when they had the uh, the Salem witchcraft trials, I I don't I don't believe they were burned at the stake then. I believe in America, I'm pretty sure they were hung. If I'm not mistaken, so uh, what? With, with with King James wanting to eradicate all of the rotten pumpkins from his kingdom that were trying to uh, that were plotting against him, that were plotting against his nation, that were servants of the enemy. King James, I think, got rid of some rotten pumpkins, but I also think that there was a giant pumpkin looming in the background that he couldn't even have imagined. And that's what I try to picture in this image. Thank you to Adobe and the AI programs they provide for helping me create this image. And for those of you that help me with the subscription to be able to keep up with payments to actually be able to make images like this. So, personally, let me get into this real quick about the giant pumpkin. Just some thoughts. The giant pumpkin, obeying the Bible's command to not suffer which to live is not an easy work when you're a king of England. But there's a problem. Just like with uh, drug busts, with abusers, with con artists, with Satanists, and with politicians, the ones that are actually doing the most damage and are actually in control are almost never the ones who actually suffer. James and the public at large were successful in torturing and killing a lot of women and a very few men, but 400 years later, it's difficult to tell how many of them were actually guilty and how many had confessed. How many had con had a confession literally twisted out of them? So, I wouldn't be able to tell you if all these different people actually did what they were accused of. Maybe they did, maybe some did, maybe a lot of them didn't. That's one of the things in America is that we did not, we, we would rather have everybody, every single evil person escape than have one person be unjustly accused and suffer for it. 
That's why we assume innocence until guilt is proven. And we need to uphold that. We also wouldn't agree with King James on the divine right of kings. I'll mention that in a second if I get a chance. It is interesting to note that the confession of a witch was believed to cause said witch to lose her powers. The implications, however, are downright horrifying. What if you had no confession to make? What if you were innocent, but you were accused nonetheless? Simply put, you'd probably have to confess or be tortured to death. Because, think about it, this lady is not confessing. She wants to keep her power, so she's not confessing. We need to torture her within an inch of her life until she finally confesses, and then she loses her power, and yay, we did our job. <sighs> Under this type of, these types of circumstances, now, now you might wonder exactly why Gail refers to the demonology in this book, in all of thy word, a total of 14 times. Each one of them, it is referring to like, oh, this is bad, this is bad. Oh, yes, we would agree with King James. King James is good. Uh, King James says, oh, this is good, this is good. The scripture is infallible, uh, stuff like this. Oh, this is good, this is good. I like what King James is saying on this page. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, you betcha. And then. As far as I'm aware, she doesn't mention anything about the witch trials. Why do we not talk about them? There should be a lot more conversation going on, I think, about this stuff. Here's where it gets interesting. <sighs> Under this type of circumstances, how many guiltless vi victims would have suffered? The Inquisition in mainland Europe was famous for killing heretics, that means Protestant Christians, political opponents, and other threats to papal authority, as witches and sorcerers. Let's just say I have a lot of questions. Here's some of them. How many questions do you have thinking about this? How many inquisitors who are actually Satanists, like Malachi Martin talks about, um, are pre being prevalent in the, the Jesuitism and in the, Vat in the Vatican? How many of them were actually Satanists but got away with it because they used their power for the greater glory of God? How many witches were killed because they wouldn't use their powers for God or they simply wouldn't sleep with Quasimodo's wicked stepfather, like in the Hunchback of Notre Dame? How many kings were blackmailed? Well, by the way, Hunchback of Notre Dame ended a little bit differently than uh, the Disney video shows. So, just letting you know. How many kings were blackmailed by papists, by uh, lending their supernatural services to them? Oh, well, we won't tell anybody, so long as this and this and that. How many witches accused their rivals and got away with their own practices? So, oh, Agatha over there. She's um, she's getting a little bit ahead of me in the witchcraft circle, so I think I'm going to take care of her. Or maybe, oh, this person, this peon witch, is, uh, she's being a little bit of a pain. Let's get rid of her. Have somebody accuse her. Yes, my lord. How many evil husbands took this opportunity to get their wife killed off so they could uh, jump in bed with the girl next door? How many times do you think that happened? How have these witch hunts been used to further the agenda of the New World Order, in whose shadow we all reside? So that last point. The King James Bible was authorized by King James, and his name been, has been attached to it for a very long time. Witches and Harry Potter fans alike have been trained to think of James as a black-hearted witch hunter. What a turnoff for the Bible that bears his name. 
let alone the Bible's clear teaching against witchcraft. A King James Bible might as well be called the I want to kill you Bible. When a witch sees a King James Bible, or when they see a book like New Age Bible versions defending the King James Bible, it, it literally might as well be called the I want to kill you Bible. It really should be for, for their perception. By the way, let me add something. There are people that have been involved in uh, the, the crazy abuse programs, let's call them. And uh, there was one lady that could not read her Bible. She could listen to the Bible. She could read any other book, but she had it apparently programmed into her that she could not read the Bible. And she was trying and she was struggling to do it. It wasn't because it was archaic. It was because she simply couldn't do it. And she could just barely get through. She could just barely get a little bit by the time she was having an interview with Tony Merkel. I will also say that there are people who are programmed. You might want you might wonder why some people hate Jesus. There are people in this world that have been programmed. They've been trained, uh, they have been brainwashed. So that when they hear Jesus loves you, they literally don't hear that word love. It's not because of some, you know, it's not because of an, an indoctrination class they went to. They literally hear Jesus hates you. It's an interesting thing. I wonder how all of that plays into this. Cook up your ideas. Put them in the comments. I want to hear them. I think it's going to be awesome. So this situation with the King James Bible. It's not a great situation for cult evangelism, to say the least. Of course, Bill Schneblin always used the King James Bible in his cult evangelism and did a pretty good job. This has often made me wonder, was the revised version and subsequent modern Bible translations made to appeal to the wider public, which was growing more friendly toward magic, fortune-telling, spell-casting, and necromancy in the late 1800s and even more so today? Is the revised version and uh, the ESV and the LSB, uh, the NASB, New King James maybe even, the living, the message, good news for modern man, all of these, and so many more. Are they made to try to get away from the witch hunting king? Food for thought. Let me know what you think below, and we'll try to get this page published sometime this week before this video airs, so head on over to the Bible Version Conspiracy and check out King James, the King, the James, the Bible. I want to add something, a little twist. We've been going for two and a half. We've been going for about an hour and a half now once I crop the uh, the front end off of this thing because we weren't able to jump right in this evening. Let me, uh, let me throw a curveball at you, so to speak. As far as this whole uh, fascinating idea goes, it's a little book by a guy named Joe Casti. A very controversial book, as I understand. Very controversial conclusions among historians. I would love to hear what uh, David Teams would have to say about this. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. It is on our, uh, our uh, library 
on uh, by uh, Bible version conspiracy.com. There's a link to that in the description. You can check out many other books that we have back here that we offer links for to Amazon and they are affiliate links. Not because I'm greedy. We get pennies from your purchases, but it's something and I appreciate it and my family appreciates it too. And if you have any other bigger purchases you want to kind of add into there, be my guest. We get, I think, like 6%, something like that. It's that much percent that doesn't go back to Amazon. And that's that's just worth it enough. And I mean, my goodness, what we're doing right now is basically a small business. Basically. Basically. So let me read a little bit of this to you. The front cover is Joe Casti is the name of the author. It's called Malicious History. An investigation into King James VI of Scotland and I of England and his place in the history of witch hunts. That's the cover. The back. Joe Casti is a student of history specializing in the time period that the witch hunts were prevalent. He shares his Master of Arts thesis research that will challenge the status quo that has been written for centuries about King James VI of Scotland and I of England. The evidence Joe shares is compelling, but you can decide for yourself. I think that should have been the last line, personally. Despite the common belief that James's record of uh, record as King of Scotland is marred by his overwhelming drive to eliminate witches. Evidence exists to the contrary. Hmm. To the contrary of this popular belief. Interesting. James was involved in the witch hunts, but he was not their instigator. While James's record as king, now if you watch the timeline documentary thing, you're going to think that this was his personal campaign to bring the uh, the corrupt, superstitious nature of Europe to Britain. Interestingly, James was involved in the witch hunts, but he was not their instigator. While James's record as king during the great persecutions of 1590 to 1597 is not stellar. It is by no means one that reflects the avid bloodthirsty reputation that which is attached. Most historians will be very negative about this body of work, but the information is shared to open your mind to facts and not read just the opinions of the leaders today. Or of that day. It ends with uh, opinions of leaders that day, which I think needs help. So the cover has some typos. The text is absolutely enormous as far as books go. But I am looking forward to it. The table of contents, is there? Yes, there is. So there's introduction, first chapter, James and the Witches of Scotland, James the author, the witchcraft statutes, contemporary writers and their effect on James's reputation, trials, public sentiment, and political action, the history of statute of the statute of 1604. And witchcraft fraud exposed and pardoned by King James. Interesting. It's 110 pages long. So there's a guy from the uh, uh, church history of Britain, Dr. Thomas Fuller, 1655, and this quotation's on page six. 
The frequency of forged possessions wrought such an alteration upon the judgment of King James that, quote, uh, Lipsis Marks, he grew first diffident of, and then flatly to deny, the workings of witches and devils as mere falsehood and delusions. Interesting. Very interesting. He's got quite a few references, too, in his bibliology, or uh, bibliography. It stretches from page 141 to page 149. It's quite a few. I'm looking forward to this. I hope you guys are looking forward to it, too. Like I said, if you've already watched this video, holy cow, it's been so long. You've wasted so much time with the opinion of this 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 scrawny 31 year old in a, in upstate new york this goofball that used to that used to talk in front of a blanket draped over a door way back in the day maybe you saw some of those old videos maybe you didn't my goodness this guy is still talking and you're going this guy actually has a point thank you Thank you very much. I appreciate the validation the, uh, that uh, that's great. If you've watched this already, if you're not subscribed, why aren't you subscribed? I mean, honestly, do yourself a favor. Hit that subscribe button. And give this video a like and give it a share. If you think that somebody else might like this video, just share it on your social media and see, you, you know, if you don't want to have any friends. <laughs> I mean, share it with your enemies. That way uh, they'll stay even further away from you, right? So, anyways. I appreciate your listening here. I appreciate everything that you guys do, guys do for us. I'm looking forward to our private chat for anybody that wants to join us after that. I see there are two people watching. <coughs> there is the illustrious Daniel Jones, no doubt. And possibly my in-laws. That'd be awesome to see both of you guys in the live chat in a moment you have the links you have the link for this youtube video you've got the link for the live stream the live after show as well click that link i'll add you to the stage and we can have a little chit chat and that's always awesome i love talking to you guys all right until next time read that little old king james Bible. Like the devil, not somebody dressed up as him. Like the devil is after it. Because there truly is this little thing I like to call the Bible version conspiracy. Have a good one. We'll talk soon. And I'm looking forward to it. God bless. So here I got all the way to the end of the video and I forgot to bring up the stuff that was crazy. Usually I bring the crazy in at the end and I remember better, but sorry about that. Here we go. We're recording after the fact and we're going to talk about it now. So the first thing is the right of the divine king. Now to my remembrance of this, it's, it's something that Bill Schneblin talked about. I haven't been able to find any other information about it online, but apparently the gist of it is when a kingdom has either like a famine or the king is not somebody that is desired by possibly the cult, they perform this thing called the Rite of the Divine King in which the concept is that the king is supposed to die so that the empire or the people of the empire or the kingdom can be better off. And if the king isn't available or the assassination attempts go awry, 
such as the multiple assassination and kidnapping attempts that happened to our beloved King James. Hmm. They sacrificed somebody in his place. So, I'll provide some links on our page. BibleVersionConspiracy.com slash King James. And you guys can check out more of that information for yourself. Am I at 5% battery? I is. I am low on battery. So let's wrap this up. The other thing is that we really... And, and I'm going to add more of my suspicions and thoughts and stuff like this to uh, um, to kind of expand those on the same page. So I'm hoping that each of our pages on on Bible Version Conspiracy can be a, a living page that when I find out more things, I can add more to them. Not like, you know, not like a blog post that just gets put further down, but something that's right there and accessible and you guys can you guys can access more of the information that I find out over time. So, the second thing is that we really, really, really don't want King James to be part of, uh, you know, the Illuminati or what have you. The thing is, um, is researcher Barbara Aho, at least, that I know of, because she does a lot of research with, like, you know, what they would call the powers that be. She... Uh, in her interviews with Kelly McGinley, in our series that we've dubbed uh, For King and Cabal, you can check them out on our YouTube channel. And I'll also try to put that at the end of this video. She says that she thinks King James could have been an exception and not have been involved in that stuff based on his writings and the many things that he said against witchcraft and how they persecuted him and tried to kill him multiple times and such like this, and basically fought them his entire life. So she takes that as a sign that he wasn't, he was an exception in the Stuart line, that he was not actually part of the occult, part of the cabal, as it were. So fingers crossed that he wasn't. Most people that I've found so far that claim that King James was part of a cult or his wife, Anne of Denmark, part of a cult or what have you, we've talked about it a couple of times on this channel. Most of those people seem to want to give King James a black eye because of his involvement chiefly in the King James Bible, and they want to thus give a black eye to the King James Bible. So... You know, just kind of dominoes from there. I would say that giving him the benefit of the doubt is not something that I would want to say, uh, you know, he wasn't part of a cult. I mean, he, in my opinion, he could have been. Oh, Joseph, how could you believe that King James? How could you? Well, the thing is, is that the Bible that we have, I think is the Bible that we should have. And, uh, you know... It doesn't need to be authorized by a completely godly, um, above-board king. Because he just said that it could be translated. That's that's the influence that he had on it, basically. The interview with Kelly McGinley, the interviews with Kelly McGinley did, went very interestingly. She, uh, Barbara Aho, talked a lot about King James's background and his, his war, basically, against the cabal and uh, how they tried to kill him many, many times, and the influence that is supposed to have been from uh, Francis Bacon. It is a fascinating interview series. <sighs> you guys you guys just have to listen to it. There's so many questions in my mind afterwards. And at the end of it, it ended very, very interestingly, and I don't think that Barbara had a really good answer to what was presented to her by Kelly McGinley right there at the end of part four, I believe. Either it was part four or part three. I forget how many parts it is. But she still has to... I still have to get back to her. She was supposed to get back to me, but I should follow up with her. I mention this often. At, and ask her where her research is because she was she was waffling on the idea that there weren't Rosicrucians involved in the translation of the King James. I think a lot of it might be because of what's called the King James Code, which is often... Uh, um, blamed on people like Francis Bacon and some sort of supernatural event that 
wasn't necessarily of God. A lot of other people try to use it to claim the King James Bible is inspired, like Brandon Peterson, Mike Hoggard, people like this. King, uh, Gail Ripplinger herself does something similar. So, a lot to research, a lot of interesting things, and we didn't even get to the reptilian side of the royal family, so I guess I'll leave that for another time. God bless and thanks for watching.